All right, so we're going to start off like we usually do, except for I'm not quite ready for that. Let's see. Uh, we're going to read Psalm 11. We're reading one chapter out of Psalm to start, or at least typically one chapter. Uh, I was so busy getting that whole entire list together of things to pray for that I didn't get to the chapter. All right, Psalm 11. And this is another Psalm of David. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string to shoot in darkness at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. The one and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked, he will rain snares. Fire and brimstone will, and burning wind will be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. Um, interestingly enough, on the, in these psalms, a lot of the themes that run through psalms also run through Revelation. Uh, as, as we go through it, you'll, you'll see, I think, connections to some degree. Uh, just like we talked about, also there's a lot of connections back from the Old Testament with Genesis and, and the prophets and all those kind of things. So we'll talk more about that too as we go. Um, all right, so where we're at in our study on Revelation, if I can find my place here. So we started out, we spent a couple weeks talking about apocalyptic language and specifically focusing in on Jesus' discussion about the pro prophecies related to the destruction of Jerusalem and the speech that he uses. And we use that because apocalyptic language oftentimes sounds like the end of the world. So you think your mind automatically goes to, you know, this is talking about the second coming of Christ. But that's not necessarily what it's talking about because it, the way the language is being used, it's meant to give you an image of what's coming. And a lot of that apocalyptic language is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, so anyway, we use that as an example just so, so to kind of give a foundation for what what we're going to be seeing as we look at this uh, language in Revelation. Then we talked about some things just about the book itself, you know, normal things that you would need to know. So who wrote the book? John, we know, wrote the book. Approximately when did he write it? You know, there's, we talked about there's some debate on that, but somewhere in, in the uh, late first, or is that second century? I don't forget how you count that. The 81 to 96, or maybe even a little later, uh, dating there. Um, and we talked about what's going on and, and at that time and the importance of, you know, the, Rome, the influence of Rome and the politics of the day and what that has to do with, with what's written in Revelation. Last week, we talked about the different ways that Revelation can be interpreted, and that really kind of centers around what you think the prophecies are related to, like when they're supposed to happen. Um, you know, and, we, and we've emphasized, well... Actually, I'm not even going to get there because we're about to cover it. Uh, so anyway, that's what we talked about. And then we started in on when are the prophecies to be fulfilled uh, last week. And so that's, most, that's probably what we're going to focus on mostly today. We might get to a few other things. But, uh, you know, there are many people out there that look for fulfillment of Revelation still. Like they're looking, and they're looking in Revelation and they're seeing these prophecies. Um, they're, you know, what things that we talked about when we, when we discussed premillennialism, the rapture, tribulation, thousand-year reign, Armageddon, all these things, and they're looking for specific events that are going to occur from these prophecies. So, but, the, and I think I told you, you know, I don't, that's not the way I look at it. I think that uh, these prophecies are centered around Rome uh, and were to happen shortly, and we talked about that. Uh, so I think you have to consider the context in order to figure out when these things are supposed to happen. And the first thing we want to do is go to Revelation 1, 1 through 3, and this is kind of where we ended uh, last week. Does one of you guys want to read Revelation 1, 1 through 3? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bond servants the things which he must soon take place. And he sent and communicated by his angel, his bond servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all he saw. Blessed is he who reads and, and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written for it for his time is near. Okay, so right there in the first three verses of, of the book, he says, things that must shortly take place and 
for the time is near. So we see two phrases there that indicate the time of when this is supposed to happen. Is it supposed to be a long time? No, it's supposed to happen shortly. What's that? Pretty soon, okay. So, so we set that as the, as the beginnings for this and then go back, uh, let's flip back to Revelation 22 because not only does the book start off saying that these things are to happen soon, it also ends that way. Uh, somebody wanna read six and 10? <clears throat> From 22. And he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And he, and the Lord of the God of spirits of prophets sent his angel to show his bond servants the things which must be soon take place. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Okay, so once again, emphasis, emphasis is that this time is near. Uh, if somebody starts off telling you something, hey, this is about to happen, and ends telling you this is about to happen, are you thinking it's going to be several hundred years or thousands of years? Of course. Of course. That's the first thing that comes to your mind, right? So, so he wrote these things to the Romans, I mean the Romans, under Roman rule, and yet people are trying to attach these prophecies to long future events, things that are to happen way in the future, right? They're still looking for prophecies and things like that. So that's the first thing that we want to set because that, knowing that, having that knowledge impacts a lot of how you interpret what's in Revelation. Um, okay, so where we actually ended last week was on 2 Peter 3.8. Uh, you know, some people will say, well, you know what, it says it's going to happen in a short time, but to God, time doesn't matter. So, you know, it could still be a short time even though, you know, even though it hasn't happened yet. He could have still, it could still say that. So let's read 2 Peter 3. And actually, I want to read a little bit more than 8. I don't know. Yeah, we have more than 8 up there. That's good. Uh, let's go back and do... Start with 7. Do we have 7 up there? Yeah, you can go back to 7. Let's do 7 through 9. That'll probably be enough. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that, there, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, and some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Okay, so we talked about how this passage is, the way I've heard it at least, is used to try to justify two what I would call uh, incorrect doctrines, misconceptions. One would be that the Lord created the world in millions of years because a day to him could be millions of years. So it's meant to try to coincide with the theory of evolution and, and try to match those things up. If you believe in God and you believe he can do what he said, he says he created in a day, I think probably we ought to believe that. Uh, then number two would be coming back to Revelation, <laughs> saying that, uh, that these things, um, since time doesn't matter to God, saying shortly doesn't matter. Like it could, it could be a long time off. The problem with that is Revelation isn't written to God God's writing it to us, and he doesn't use time in a way that confuses us. So, and we're going to go through some examples of that here uh, as to how time is used. But it's, it's, it's taking this verse totally out of context to say that it's applying to these things. Like, what, what is the point of this verse? What's, what's being said? That God, in the fiction, he's going to destroy the heavens and the earth. Just chill out. Right, he, he's God. God, it's a, it's a quality of God that's being emphasized, right? That he, what, what, what does it? If you read some other verses, and I don't remember right off my hand, off of the top of my head, but if we read, go to some other verses, what do we deserve when we sin against God? <laughs> we deserve, we deserve what? We deserve to die immediately, right? Do we see any examples of that in the Bible where somebody is killed immediately for for what they do? Anybody remember one? What? 
where somebody dies immediately for their sin. Ananias and Sapphira, and Sapphira. Uh, Uzzah, right? And, and that, Uzzah, was, was Uzzah even trying to do anything wrong? Uh, wrong, wrong because he was disobeying God, but it was in his mind. It wasn't intentional, right? Even the idea of the way they were transporting the well, yeah, the, the whole, yeah, the whole thing was the whole thing was wrong as far as what they were doing. But he wasn't. His intent was not to defy God in what he was doing, but he was defying God, and that's the problem. <laughs> um, so, uh, but his thought was to try to protect it from falling, and he reached out and touches it, and he gets killed right away. So, anyway, the point being. We, we deserve death when we sin, and that's the point of this verse, is God doesn't mete out punishment at, you know, right, right away or as we do things that we deserve it for. He's patient toward us. It's a quality and a character of God. Um, so, yeah, that, that verse, I think, gets misapplied for, the, like I said, those two main reasons. I don't know if there's other places where it gets applied, but to me, that's, that's the, the two main things where it gets misapplied. All right, so a couple of things then as far as to emphasize this shortly concept and that God, when he says shortly, means according to us, not thousands of years or whatever. Um, all right, so I'm just going to read this because I, I, uh, I put this down. Uh, so before we look at some of the scriptures that use those terms, Take a look at the compiled list of dates before, and the, the terms that I'm referring to there are the shortly or quickly in, in, the, in the scripture. Um, let's put up the uh, list of the dates around the Messiah there. Um, yeah, let's go down to the second one, I think is where we want to deal with. Yeah, before the coming. Um, you may not be able to read that very well because it's pretty small up there. Um, but of specific importance to the discussion are the time periods that Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel were prophesying durin, because uh, they're right, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, Ezekiel, Daniel, they're all right there in the, what, like seven, 700 to 586, or maybe a little past the destruction of Jerusalem. In that time phrase, remember we're in BC, so it's going down <laughs> here. So we're going from like, uh, you know, 750, maybe 760 down to five, 580s, somewhere in there. Um, so, uh, so that's the prof that's the period that they were prophesying during. Jeremiah was known as the, as the weeping prophet, and he prophesied from 627 to 583. So I guess a little bit more than what I was saying there. Um, and things were good when he started under the reign of Josiah, but then uh, took a pretty bad turn after Josiah's death. Um, Ezekiel prophesied from approximately 597 B.C. to 575 B.C., and he's the prophet that laid on his side for 390 days to symbolize the punishment for Israel, and then on his right side for 40 days to symbolize the punishment for Judah. So we're getting into those symbols here and, and things representing time and, and that kind of stuff that we'll see linking to Revelation to some degree. Um, and when, of course, in the scripture, we're told that the days represent years. That is actually laid out for us there. So we know that uh, the punishment for Israel was 390 years and Judah 40 years, at least in this particular uh, prophecy. Um, Daniel was a young man taken into Babylonian captivity in 605 BC, and Daniel is known for being thrown into the lion's den, right? That's what everybody knows him for. But of course, there's a lot of prophecies that go along with Daniel as well. Um, so these prophets were all around the same time period uh, and would have been prophesying between, you know, like we said, 627 and 575 BC. So when was the destruction of Jerusalem that Jeremiah and Ezekiel were prophesying about? When did that happen? I think it's up there. <laughs> about 586 BC. Um, 
And then when was the rise of the Medes and the Persians? Because that's another important thing. We see it right there, 5, 539 BC, right? So right, right around that time period. Okay, so keep those, you know, I'm sure everybody's like me, you remember those dates perfectly. And everybody, you know, that's, that's why I, I, I always have trouble with history because I'm horrible at, you, you, I probably can't even tell you, well, I can't even tell you the right century, so, um, so that's a problem. Okay, so let, now let's go to some scriptures uh, that we can look at to see when a prophecy, when it says something's going to happen, what that time period means. Uh, Genesis 41, 25 through 32. Now Joseph said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has told to Pharaoh what he's about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and seven good, year, and seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one and the same. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after the, are seven years, and the seven thin ears scorch the earth scorched by the wind and will be seven years of famine. It is as I have spoken to Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he's about to do. Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming in all the land of Egypt, and after them seven years of famine will come, and all the abundance will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will ravage the land. So the abundance will be unknown in the land because of the subsequent famine for it is very severe. Now as for the repeating of the dream to Pharaoh twice, it means that the matter is determined by God and God will quickly bring it about. All right, quickly bring it about. Uh, so Joseph tells Pharaoh that his dreams are the same because he had those two different dreams, you know, the cows and the ears of corn or grain or uh, however we translate that. Uh, and the message was delivered twice because he's emphasizing it's about to happen soon. All right, so that's one. Let's go to Jeremiah 27, 16 and 17. Then I spoke to the priests and to all, the pe all these, this people, saying, Thus says the Lord, not listen to the words of your prophets who prophes prophesy to you, saying, Behold the vessels of the Lord's house will now surely be brought again from Babylon, for they are prophesying a lie to you. Do not listen to them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. Why should this city become a ruin? All right, so here, going back to some history there, which I'm, once again, not great at, but um, the priests here are saying Babylon, the Babylonian occupation is going to end shortly. They're emphasizing shortly, and uh, God's saying they're lying to you, all right? Do you think, like, whenever they're saying it's going to end shortly, how long do you think the people were thinking it was going to be? Not very long, right? And, but here it says, God's saying they're lying to you. It's not shortly. Uh, how long was it? It was a couple hundred years. Uh, so we know that it, long, the long de definition here is how far out? Within 300 years or whatever we, you know, whatever we just said there, uh, right? So that's the long definition, and it's not that shortly. Uh, so we can see the opposite going on here. They're lying to you because they're saying it's going to happen shortly, and it's not going to happen shortly. Um, all right, Ezekiel 7, 1 through 9. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, And you, the Son of Man, thus saying the Lord, and the land of Israel, an end. End is coming on the four corners of the, of the land. Now the end is upon you, and I will send my anger against you. I will judge you according to your ways and bring all your abominations upon you. For my eye will have no pity on you, nor will I spare you. But I will bring your ways upon you, and your admirations will be among you. And then you will know that I am the Lord. Thus says the Lord, a disaster, unique disaster, behold, it is coming. And it is coming, and the end has come. It is awkwardly against you. Behold, it has come. Your doom has come to you, O inhabitant of the land. The time, the time has come. The day is near. Turmoil rather than joyful shouting on the mountain. Now I will surely pour out my wrath on you and spread my anger against you. 
judge, judge you according to your ways and bring you to your abomination. My eye will show no pity, nor will I spare you and repay you according to your ways. While your adorations are in the midst, then you know that I am the Lord, do the smiting. All right, so this prophecy uh, is part of the details of impending doom that have been outlined in, in chapter 6 and 7 of Ezekiel. Once again, going back to that dates that we talked about, Ezekiel was prophesying from approximately 597 B.C. When did the doom happen? 586. We're talking about a 10-year period, maybe. If that, maybe not that long, but maximum of like 10 years, basically. So, once again, shortly, how long is that to be? Maybe 10 years? Maybe. That's giving it on the long end, I would say. Um, Ezekiel 12, 21 through 28. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, what is a proverb you people have been concerning the land of Israel, saying, The days are long, unless their revision fails. Therefore say them to them, Thus says the Lord, I will make his proverbs cease, so they were no longer used as a proverb in Israel. But tell them the days draw near, as well as fulfillment of every vision. For there will be no longer any false vision or flattering division within the house of Israel. For I, the Lord, will speak, and whatever the word, word I speak will be performed. It is no longer being delayed in your, your days. O Rebulus, can't talk to that. House, I will speak the word and perform it, declares the Lord. Therefore the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold the house of Israel, saying, The vision that sees, this is for many years from now, and prophecies of times far off. Therefore say to them, Thus say the Lord God, None of my words will be delayed any longer. Whatever word I speak will be performed, declares the Lord. All right, so here, and again, pro relating to prophecies from Ezekiel, he says, you know, God's warning of coming judgment, but the ungodly are mocking and saying, ah, that's a long time off. And what does God say? Not so much. It's coming soon. So same thing here again. With it, we're within that, like, 10-year time frame that, that these things are coming and are, are going to happen. Uh, final one that I want to go through, and this one's a little more complicated, Daniel chapter 8, verses 21 through 26. The shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece, and the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. The broken horn and the four horns that are cross, that arose in its place represent the four kingdoms, which will arise from his nation, although not with his power. Oops, hold on here. Backed up too far. Here we go. In the latter period of the rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise, insolent and skilled in intrigue. His power will be mighty, but not of his own power. He will, he will, and he will destroy to an extraordinary degree, and prosper and perform his will, he will destroy mighty men and the holy people. And although his shrewdness, and, all, and, and through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. And he will magnify himself in his heart, and he will destroy many while they are at ease. And he will even, even oppose the prince of princes and he will be broken without human agency. <clears throat> the vision of the evenings and the vision of the evenings in the mornings, which he has been told, which has been told is true, but keep the keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. All right. So this one, or I'm not going to get into all the interpretations of of this different. Like this is gets into the. Uh, I think this is where you get into premillennialism and you can get different interpretations and all that sort of stuff. What I want to emphasize from this one, though, and we will get more into it when we hit another spot in this less series of lessons, but what I wanted to just mention is compare this passage, specifically verse 26, where it says, and the vision of the evenings and mornings, which has been told is true, 
but keep the vision secret for it pertains many days in the future. So it's saying this vision is far off, right? Many days in the future. Now go to Revelation, back to Revelation 22.10 that we read earlier. This is at the end of this revelation. And it says, And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. So back in Daniel, we have, uh, hold it, close it up because we're not close to it. And here we have, don't seal it because the time is near. Big difference, right? Um, so Daniel, uh, you know, in Daniel, it's a long way off and the other is not a long way off. So how long until the events that were in Daniel's vision were to take place? We, we kind of can figure that out, right? If we, depending once again on how you interpret it. But if you go back through, and I don't, this is where I don't want to get into late, but, but he talks about Greece and the kingdoms that are to arise and all that. So how far off was this prophecy? Well, if you calculate it based off of that normal interpretation, it's about 400 years. So once again, we're talking how far, you know, 400 years is a long ways off. So how can people go to Revelation where it says, don't steal this because it's hap going to happen in the very near future and say it still hasn't happened yet. Using, you're just using the guidelines that we see from prophecies and what the Bible says there. So anyway, that's just a little bit more of proof and, and of my way of thinking and of many people's way of thinking as to saying that what Revelation is talking about, the prophecies. Now, then, we're about to talk about a little bit more. There's a lot of things in Revelation that aren't actually prophecies. There's a whole other part of Revelation, and then it's a very important part. Um, but as far as the prophecy parts of Revelation, how can we say that it's still to come when we're thousands of years later and it says it was about to happen? So that's the question I pose, and I th hopefully I laid out a good argument for saying that that's not the case, that, that these things have happened. Uh, and, and then once you get that set, that helps a lot with as we go through and start interpreting what the symbols and the visions and the prophecies, what those things mean. Okay, so uh, like I said, I'm try I want to try to wrap up here. Well, I, I may not have said that earlier today. I said it somewhere along the way. Uh, but today, I want to try to wrap up kind of what I call the introduction. I don't know how many weeks we've been doing this, but I call this the introduction because we're kind of laying a foundation for what's going on with Revelation and what, what we're looking at. Um, I don't know if I'll get totally through my, the last of my introductory material here or not, but we'll see. But I want to emphasize that, like I just said, there are, there are three major elements in the book of Revelation. One, uh, predictions, prophecies. Uh, but as we just discussed, if 2,000 years ago John says they're going to pass, come to pass shortly, should we still be looking for these things in the future? I would say not. I would say that, that they have already occurred and that we can look back and see that. Number two, uh, comfort and encouragement for the persecuted Christians of John's day. In Revelation, the certainty of victory for God's people and defeat for those who oppose them is made over and over again. Uh, the symbolism changes, the imagery changes, and, and it's meant to, to, to convey encouragement for the people of God. Uh, despite the awesome power of Rome, and the conflict and suffering that they were going to go through or were going through, uh, when everything's said and done, the victory belongs to those who are in Christ. And there are several sections that we see in Revelation that are meant to convey this sense of security and, uh, and of victory and you know, comfort and encouragement uh, as you go through the, through the book. Uh, the third element, uh, at least the way that some people break it down, would be what's called timeless truths. <laughs> uh, even though the predictions may have been fulfilled and the words of comfort were meant specifically for the Christians in that time period, uh, it's still very applicable to us and to everyone until the end of time. Um, and there are several major themes or lessons uh, that I found listed in the material from, uh, I told you that I have some different sources here. This one's kind of like a compiled list of different things uh, for studying Revelation. Uh, some of the uh, things that I put up on here come from that. It's kind of like tools for, for teaching. Um, and and there, so anyway, in there, there were some, some things listed that run throughout the entire message 
of Revelation, these, these eternal lessons uh, or timeless truths. Uh, one is that Jesus' presence is guaranteed to the churches or, or the church, you, you know, whichever way you want to say that. Uh, so, you know, in chapters 2 and 3, which uh, we'll get to several weeks from now, um, <laughs> probably, but in chapters 2 and 3, we see that, you know, Jesus is in the, the midst of the church. Well, actually, in chapter 1, too, I guess, in the midst of the church. Second, God and Jesus are the proper and correct objects of worship and should be worshipped and adored by created things. In other words, um, not the created things should be worshipped, but the creator should be worshipped. Uh, we see that emphasized in, in some of the visions in Revelation. Uh, third, the patience and steadfast of the Christians, or saints, as it's mentioned in, in Revelation, is the most important thing. Uh, once again, emphasized in chapters 2 and 3, Jesus over and over, he who overcomes, to him I will give what? <laughs> all kinds of things. Uh, yes, uh, all kinds of things, but I will grant, oh yeah, I guess it is different. He just says it differently in each one. Yeah, I was thinking it was one thing, but it is different things. To eat of the tree of life, uh, shall not be hurt by the second death. So there's promises to those who overcome. Um, the defeat of evil and, oh, fourth, this is fourth. The defeat of evil and the devil is certain. Once again, seen throughout the book, but especially in chapter 20. Uh, when we get there, we'll see that. Uh, the final triumph of the church is certain and glorious, emphasized in chapters 20 through 22. Uh, and the final, re the final reward and final punishment belongs to God. He's the judge, right? Uh, so, so those things we can see uh, vividly, and they're, they're, they're drawn in pictures for us in, in the book. All right. Uh, all right, so before I go into giving a brief outline, which I, this is where I don't know if I have enough time to give this brief outline of the book, uh, let's look at some information about how the Old Testament, yeah, this is probably where we're going to end. We're not going to get the outline quite done here. But the out, Old Testament prophets relate to Revelation and uh, talk about the visions here. So uh, you want to put up the uh, PDF of uh, the prophets and how uh, the Old Testament prophets. Yeah, the prophets won, yep. All right, so uh, Major Prophets and Revelation is what this is titled, and I'll just read it real quick. This is obviously, it's a handout that was in this information because it has like things that you can match up and all that, but uh, several of the Old Testament books are apocalyptic in nature. All four of the major prophets are such. They were written in time of crisis. Isaiah is the first book of the prophets, Judgment to Come, is a basic part of Isaiah's teaching. Israel and Judah are to perish, but a remnant will survive, and a new Jerusalem will rise up as a city of the faithful. It is also in Isaiah that memorable, memorable prophecies of Christ's coming are found. There are at least 29 allusions to Isaiah in Revelation. Like I told you, there's a lot that we can learn going back into these prophets to, to connect to, the, to Revelation. Uh, Daniel is the last of the four major Hebrew books of the prophets. Like Ezekiel, Daniel is divided into two parts. The first six chapters tell of Daniel's faith and the greatness of his God over the idols of Babylon. That's the part that we're all familiar with, right? And then the last six chapters contain the four visions of Daniel and their interpretations. There are at least 53 allusions to Daniel in Revelation. Uh, Ezekiel is written by a prophet of the exile. The book is divided into two sections. The first announces the sins of Jerusalem. The second pictures with hope the restoration of the city after it has been purified. There are 43 allusions to Ezekiel in Revelation. And then Jeremiah is the book of the prophet Jeremiah, who received the divine call to prophecy while very young. It was his mission to predict doom upon his nation for its many sins. We just finished reading this. I read, we, as a family, we read this, and there's some pretty interesting things going on with these pr prophecies in Jeremiah. Um, for this, he was hated by the priests and the people. He stressed the importance of personal religion. There are 22 allusions to Jeremiah and Revelation. So there's a lot of stuff from these prophets that carries over in Revelation. So if you're familiar and get familiar with these, that's why I said read these prophets. But then there's another one that has a major, major uh, relationship with Revelation. Uh, let's go down to the next uh, second page on this. Zechariah uh, 
if here you can see there's a lot of visions in Zechariah that the imagery used is replicated in Revelation. Uh, so if you read Zechariah and see what's said in Zechariah, you can get a lot of the symbolism and understand, get a grasp of what's going to come with Revelation. And we won't go through that right now, but you can kind of see it for yourself there. There's a lot of, uh, uh, well, I mean, like the, the vision of the seven golden candlesticks, we hit that right off the bat in Revelation, uh, and, and we can see uh, another big thing that's up there that's, that's important would be the, uh, the olive trees, which actually that may not be up there or it's up above, I'm not sure which way, but it, olive trees are also, also mentioned in, in Zechariah, which also carries over into Revelation. So we'll see a lot of symbolism in, in those uh, things. Okay, uh, we'll, uh, before we end here, uh, if you want to put up the PDF on the visions of John, it could be broken into four, just like Daniel, we have four visions. Uh, all right, so Revelation contains four great visions, each of which is introduced by the phrase, in the spirit, when John was in the spirit, uh, meaning that he's not where he is <laughs> physically, right? Um, so each of these visions locates John in a different place. Each contains a distinctive picture of Christ, and each advances the action significantly toward his goal. So in the first set, the first vision, he, uh, he sees Christ, and he's on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, he's in the spirit, but he's still on the Isle of Patmos, and he sees Christ, and uh, Christ commends the churches for their virtues and condemns them in light uh, of his virtues. So I guess where they, where, where they are lacking, <laughs> where they need uh, work. Um, the second vision is uh, chapter 4 through 16. Uh, John is in heaven, and it shows Christ as the controller of destiny, and there's a progress, and we'll talk about these symbols then, but the, the progression of series uh, of seals, trumpets, and bowls that marked the judgment of God upon a world dominated by evil, or Rome would be uh, what, what I would say there. Uh, the third vision is in the wilderness. It portrays Christ as the conqueror of evil, and it depicts the overthrow of the society, religion, and government through the, in the destruction of Babylon and the defeat of the beast and his armies by the victorious Christ. So that, uh, that's another interesting section of the book that we'll get to uh, later on here. And then fourth, uh, John is on the great and high mountain. It shows Christ as the consummator of hope, and it depicts the establishment of the city of God, uh, the eternal destiny of his people. So uh, once again, getting back into interpretation, some of the, some of the, even some of the language on these slides, I wouldn't necessarily say exactly the way that they say it, um, but the, the general point being conveyed, I think, is, is, is uh, stated there. Um, so that's the breakdown the, the, of the divisions in Revelation and where John is as, as he's uh, providing these. All right, so we're out of time. Uh, next week, we'll pick up with a brief outline of the book, and then we'll go into the symbols and get into some details as far as what the symbols represent. And um, like, like I said, there again, not going to agree on all of it, like down to the little bitty thing, but we, I think we can get the big picture of, of what they what they mean uh, and, what they're, and what, what's being conveyed 